I am pleased now to welcome the, the thought leader on nutrient dense foods. Uh, Dan Kittredge has been an organic farmer for more than 30 years and is the founder and executive director of the Bionutrient Food Association, BFA, a nonprofit whose mission is to increase quality in the food supply. Known as one of the leading proponents of nutrient density, Dan works to demonstrate the connections between soil health, plant health, and human health. Uh, the Bionutrient Food Association, which Dan founded, is based on three objectives to educate growers on the principles and practices necessary to produce high quality crops, to educate consumers about the relative disparities in nutritional value of food currently available in the food supply, and to explain the deep physiological reasons why high quality food is important. And lastly, to survey current levels of nutrition in crops and to devise and provide a simple handheld tool that consumers can use to determine crop quality before purchase. Uh, he's got lots and lots to share with us today, I'm sure. So please welcome Dan. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I guess I'm I'm on stage. So nutrient density is a topic. Um, I have to say I'm I'm honored to be part of the the Tanio Conference as I see it. Um, if I may just go back for a you know, a moment, it was probably 2006, I think it was 2006, 2007 at the Acres Conference, where John and I met. Um, we were both young. I was late 20s, he was late teens. Um, and Bruce was, you know, the only elder who was at the, at the octave of um, Tesla or whoever, Steiner. Um, so I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this conversation. Um, I think we, what we identified then in the 2000s was that quality of food was a central point and wasn't being focused upon. And we made an agreement, John and I, that he would go for profit, I would go nonprofit, but that we would coordinate. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, he's obviously a, a, a brilliant being. Um, but I think what we've been working on, I think is, is, I'm happy to be able to present a report. So let's just say 2012, we were actively talking about a spectrometer, um, a meter that could be used to assess quality and a consumer could use and the opportunity to have that be a thing that could drive culture. Um, and in 2016, we decided the time was right and we identified some partners uh, that are now RSI and Open Team and Farmer West, brilliant, brilliant partners. Um, we had three objectives. One was, can we identify the variation in food quality? In nutrient levels, copper, zinc, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, potassium, antioxidants, polyphenols. Can we connect those variations? So one is, can we identify those variations? Two, can we connect those variations to management, causal factors, genetics, tillage, cover crops, irrigation, foliars, whatever it is. And third, can we build a meter to assess that? And real in real time, the flash of light by anyone. If a consumer can use it, then anyone else can use it. And so we've we've accomplished that in the last five years. Um, we've defined variation. It's massive: two x, five x, eight x, ten x, sixty x. Copper and you know carrots, iron and spinach. The, the variation in nutrient levels is massive. It connects directly to human health. It connects directly to management, how we take care of the soil, how we manage the land, how we caretake the environment, directly connects to those variations. And we've, we've built a, a meter 
that is, you know, rudimentary right now, but it actually is true and works. And it's on multiple continents in people's hands for testing antioxidants or polyphenols or our BQI, which is our, our rudimentary nutrient density index, six elements and two compounds. And we've put out the, the graphics recently for whatever it is in, in carrots versus grapes versus wheat. If the average variation is 4x or 6x or 2x, literally that's big. If you're buying these carrots or those carrots, it could be three times more nutritious or not. So I think the opportunity here for the growers um, is to be first movers in the fact that they're already doing the right things for the right reasons, but they could potentially accomplish greater success by being part of this collaboration. And so we've defined variation We've defined, you know, the connection to management. We've built a meter. We're moving forward on the, uh, what is nutrient density as opposed to variation, which is an important point. Um, but it sure looks like those practices that support biological flourishment and decreased farm production costs are directly correlated to increased nutrient levels, which I propose are you know, potential market actors in this space. So I don't want to actually talk for too long. I really would love to engage conversation um, about the process and what we're doing. Um, so it's, it's, it's broad and it's deep, but I would love to stop for a moment and see if anyone would like to engage. So Dan, I don't see any coming up quite yet. Yeah. Wait, uh, but so maybe you could back up. Apologies if I just missed this. Um, but do you what would how do you define quality? This is the first question. We, <laughs> it's it's an easy question, right? Not well, we we don't we don't have the answer. Um, we the the point is we don't know. The point is we're engaging in a in a collaborative process of understanding. And we've we've built a, a data structure and a meter and a, a framework to answer these questions, and we think they're important questions to answer. But we're um, we're starting with beef this year, and we're going to you know presume to have a a red yellow green on beef by the end of, the end of this year. But okay. what we've shown so far is that variation exists, and variation is massive. And we propose that connects to soil carbon and management. And for every $20 per ton of, of carbon credits you're going to earn per acre, you might earn $20 or $200 in profits of, of a premium for the quality of the crop. So it, the nutrient density seems to be um, what the regenerative communities coalescing around is a viable strategy for driving this whole proposition. Great. Okay. Well, that question gave us time to get some more audience questions. So, um, so I guess I will start with the one, the burning question, which uh, is when is the nutrient meter going to be available to market? I don't know it's if you know that. It's available right now in this rudimentary form. You okay. can go to biology.org and you can order one. Hey, okay. So, yeah. Great. So that that website is uh, put, pasted, posted, pinned, I guess is the right word to the chat, everybody. So you can go there and learn more about it and also get it. It is rudimentary, but it is it is available. Yeah. Great. Uh, OK, so lots of different questions about um, about health and everything. So I'm going to try I'm I'm going to try to get them in order. Uh, so. Uh, one question from Andrew is, how has shade management affected nutrient density in plants? How much does management affect? Shade management, yes. Or does it? It depends on the crop. All the environmental conditions that connect with biological system function are the things that connect with 
nutrient density. So it's it's hydration, it's aeration, it's soil cover, it's mineralization. All these pieces directly connect. And every crop is unique in its, its own ecosystem. That's the problem with this. There's no, you know, simple answer. It's everyone has to be present. Okay. And uh, uh, Holly wants to know, how do you prove the effect to health? The next step after we've defined the variation in nutrient levels is to do human trials. And we're prepared to do that with the beef project. Um, but we have 20 years of data that we're backed up on, which shows these specific compounds correlate with improved human health function. These ones correlate with decreased human health function. Um, it's, it's a process. We don't, we don't say we have the answer or we're going to have it immediately, but we're engaging the process. Do you have, um, so let's take the beef example, um, here, what uh, do you have acceptable nutrient levels that you're looking for in this um, for the results? We have about 550 compounds or more in the in the looking at. Some correlate to human health positive, some correlate to human health negative, some correlate to animal health positive and animal health negative. Um, it's, I mean, we're standing on 20 years of, I mean, decades of decades of research. It's not like we're figuring out anything new. We're just saying, let's connect enough samples of beef from enough different environmental conditions with their microbiomes from their feces, with their forage, with the soil that forage grew on, with their management practices. And let's publish something that says red, yellow, green. Mm -hmm. okay. That's all we're doing. Okay. So, um... So our audience has a lot of questions on this, so I'm going to keep asking them. Um, you, can tell, you can tell me if you have the answer or if we're still working towards them or if we need collaborative partners to help us get there. We, um, it's, it's only will succeed through collaboration, but yes, keep going. Uh, so Dennis and Steve ask, are any crops easier or harder to change nutrient profiles in? So in terms of how we grow things, how can we change those nutrient profiles? Not particularly. No, once you understand, um, it's simple. But... You have to understand, and that's the process we're supporting, is the true data collection around it. So are there more that we have more data on that we understand better yet, or are we kind of at this starting point where all the data is there and we still need to interpret it? We're saying let's do one crop first. Let, let it be the crop that has the largest global economic size, the largest global environmental footprint, and let's define nutrient density on that and bring red, yellow, green to that. Okay. And then start somewhere. Okay. Two um, two more specific questions. Are you seeing um, interest, interesting data coming from fermented foods, or are you um, are we first at the crops, not at the the process? Phase? There'll be very interesting data from the fermented foods. We haven't gotten there yet. Yes, hundred <laughs> percent. All right. So Dan promises there will be massively important. Yeah. That's great. And Kevin wants to know, are you seeing heightened nutrient levels in predominantly no-till systems? Yes. Very good. Okay. And increased soil carbon on average farm size of over 3,000 acres. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Okay. Two kinds. Direct connections. Nutrient levels, soil carbon, tillage. Great. Okay. Uh, okay. So Scott would like to know, and I, I think we'd all like to hear about how your research is going forward. And do you, are you still accepting samples of produce um, to do the nutrient testing? Yep. Uh, Biodenutrientinstitute.org. If you haven't been to it, uh, you can sign up as a grower partner um, or a citizen scientist if you want to uh, purchase samples off the shelf. Um, it's a new website in the last six months. So if you haven't looked, uh, yeah, absolutely. Great, that's awesome. And again, that's pinned um, at the top of the chat screen for everybody. Um, what are the elements and compounds that the meter evaluates? The meter uh, currently, it, it doesn't evaluate anything directly. It takes a spectral signature and it back calibrates from an algorithm. So it's not testing directly, minor point, technical point, whatever. Um, we do antioxidants, polyphenols, bricks, and we call it BQI, which is 
I think it's calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, sulfur, uh, zinc, and iron, antioxidants, and polyphenols. So we'll say BQR level in least wheat is 84th percentile. And we'll say we have a 20% confidence interval. So it's between 74th and 94th percentile. We'll say 84, but with a, with, we'll show the range also. So it's, I mean, the meter is proof of concept. It is, you know, an apple tree, but we, yeah. We, yeah. <laughs> it's true on 10 crops and more this year. Yeah. So 10 crops and more coming this year in terms of the crops we're evaluating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So David asks, I struggle in my area to find any retail food outlet that is remotely showing us how to eat the right foods. Um, and how to eat them right. What models have you seen at the end of the supply chain that are pulling the food from fine farmers to people who desire to eat right? Um, there's, I mean, any number of global grassroots movements of people that are showing up. There's the slow food movement. I mean, anybody can say, I'm gonna be a slow food chapter leader and host an event. Um, people set up, uh, farmers markets, there's all kinds of ways that people engage. But I think what we're proposing is that whether it's through an event, you know, a, a, a farmers market or a, anything else, if you have a meter, you can go and test. And so you can engage whatever communities out there, the permaculture community, the, the you know, the organic community, um, and the school lunch community. Let's look at what the quality of the food is and have a conversation about it. Let's have it be honest and transparent. Great. Something we know that consumers are demanding too as well is that transparency. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, what crop product, I think you said this, there's 10 crops um, that you're looking at right now. What 10 crops are those and what are the ones that you have up next after that? I'm not sure I have the exact number of which 10 we have now, which is the next 10 are, but um, in the list is uh, carrots, beets, potatoes, leeks, Swiss chard, mizuna, mustard, um, um, beans, uh, squash, um, cucumbers, blueberries, oats, wheat, apples. Um, you know, it's a, it's a broad spectrum, roots, leaves, fruits, and grains. Um, but you know, that's on variation and the next step is nutrient density. So. Okay. Perfect. Uh, and you already mentioned that people can go onto your website to find, um, what, uh, how they can get their stuff tested. Are you only accepting uh, products for those ones that you mentioned? Uh, to be able to test a crop, we have to have a, a process for it. So a group recently said, we want to do ginger. We said, okay, great. It's going to cost five thousand dollars for us to figure out how to test in ginger. We said, okay, now we can test ginger. So we haven't done soybeans yet. And it'll it'll take a few bucks to figure out how to do soybeans, but we have a you know a, a big list of roots, leaves, fruits, and and um, you know grains. Great. Um, there was just one that I really liked here that I need to find. Yeah. So Ryan asks, have you determined any trends with practices that have the greatest impact on higher quality or nutrient density? And I think you do. So I'll let you, I'll let you talk about that for a minute. The practices matter. The labels don't. What we basically found is local or organic doesn't correlate. A claim of regenerative does not correlate. A practice of no-till or cover crops does. So it's, it really comes down to what you do as a grower is what causes the nutrient variation to occur. And is the labels do not correlate. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very exciting. It, it confirms the hypothesis we had. So Dan, that's interesting because there's a question in my presentation that I didn't get to that maybe you can address from your perspective, which is, so how do you feel about all these certifications that are coming up? <laughs> I didn't go into my backstory at the beginning of the presentation, but my parents wrote some of the first organic standards in the country in the 80s, and I watched the system 
get perverted. Um, and I think the concept of a binary, you are or are not, is is foundationally incorrect. You know, life is a continuum and quality is a continuum. This carries the 80th percentile, the 60th percentile, the 20th percentile. That's not certified, not certified. That's 86 years old. And the ability to perceive directly with a meter, to flash a light at a thing and say, okay, 60, that gives empowerment. If it's true, if the, if the data is true, if the meter is true, if the, if the whole information structure is honest, it gives empowerment. And that's what we've been trying to accomplish. Um, and I think, you know, we're well positioned to keep moving forward on is that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think labels are, are passe. I mean, they're, they're 20th century, you know, we're, we're going, we're going to direct perception, not this religion thing, you know, <laughs> direct perception. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, sh shocking to hear you say that. Um, do you have, um, do you have specific crops that you research data? For example, sweet potatoes. Are you, are you doing sweet potatoes? Did you mention that? No, no sweet potatoes. No. Um, carrots, beets, and potatoes. And then we have to, but not sweet potatoes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you, uh, this is interesting from Dennis and Steve specifically on, do you see a de decrease in inflammatory agents in beef, meat, or protein? 100%. The data is categorical that how you feed your chicken or your pig or your cow directly connects to the inflammation markers in the sausage, the bacon, the eggs, the cream, and directly connects to your human health outcomes. The data is categorical. Yeah. That's it's, awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, I was going to ask a question, but I think you answered one of those dumb nutrition. Like, do those those inflammatory agents are then come and affect us in our nutrition? The, the things that are foundational in cancer and heart disease and osteoporosis and everything else. Yeah. Sure. Those levels drop to the floor when you eat bacon and cream and eggs from animals that are fed well. The data, the data exists. So that's. I'm going to get into a, a larger question then. The data is out there. We're talking about this. Why don't we? Why don't we know about this? Why? Why? Like, why because does whose objective, whose objective is it? In whose objective is it to, to bring it forth? Only so, the common. So what else can we do? We have the microbiometer coming you out. Can to the, DFA. <laughs> <laughs> the DFA. Okay. Um, I mean, it's a collaborative endeavor. We we build this together. But until we know what quality is, we can't calibrate a meter to it. You know, it's pre-competitive space. This is pre-competitive space. Right. And I think something we've talked about before is that um, you, are, you are doing this so that all of the data can then be accessed by everybody, right? Open data. Is that correct? Um, you want to monetize it, go for it. But the core data is in the comments. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, uh, very good. I'm sorry if I'm skipping your questions. Feel free to drop them in there again if I'm not catching them. Uh, Paul wants to know, how do you validate your findings? Are the same varieties of a certain vegetable being looked at for regen and traditional? And I'll throw this in there and I'll repeat these questions if you want, but and are the same soil parameters such as CEC, pH, et cetera, being looked at when you compare them? Everybody's soil samples going through Logan, as well as our XRF and doing... Um, spectral analysis with the meter and um, pH and soil carbon, LOI. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, what was the first part of the question? How do you validate your findings? We have a <laughs> SOPs that are freely available for any way to look at. Are those um, also available on your website? Yeah, everything's open source. You can build a meter you can go to the website, look at the specs, build one, build a hundred and sell them. The whole thing is open source. Everything is in the comments. The data, the app, the engineering. Good. So uh, here's another uh, tech question that might be above my head, but you might know more about this in your work. Are there any projects that look at the satellite remote data and estimate potential fluctuations in food nutrition levels based on historical land use practices? I know there's a bunch of satellite data. 
but I don't know what is in all of it. Mm -hmm. I bet there's some things somewhere. Yeah, so there may be that connection drawn. But, but if not, that's a great, uh, interesting thing yeah. to look at. For sure. it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me copy and paste that and save that one. Who's, who's going to activate that one? Um, okay, let's see this question. Uh, okay, so are you getting much kickback from conventional agriculture in its supply chain? No. Uh, the conventional mindset can't see what we're doing, and the integrated one sees it as an opportunity, which has always been the objective, is to not be dogmatic about who we collaborate with, mm -hmm. but to say there will be a paradigm shift in the near future, which is that food will not be measured just on volume and aesthetic, but actual inherent value. Um, and would you like to be a first mover? Mm -hmm. so, no, we've not gotten pushback. We've only gotten much more serious interest in the recent past. Great. Do you, do you see the future of this being that value of a crop, you just mentioned aesthetics or value of a product in a grocery store is then no longer what it looks like if I have like a blemish on my apple, I'm, that's not what I'm going to be buying it for. I'm going to be buying it for the nutritional value. I wouldn't frame it exactly as that, but I think foundationally on whatever metrics the market moves, it'll be primarily nutritional value. And in relation to carbon or ecosystem credits, I think the, the, the quantity of return will be in order of magnitude larger. It's $20 per, per ton per acre, $30 per acre, whatever it is, on carbon, try 300 on premium for quality. That's a much more significant driver. I think nutrient density, and that's what's exciting right now, is I feel like those who have been tracking regenerative seriously are saying, oh, actually, nutrient density looks like a pretty good you know, stand-in and actually maybe a more powerful economic driver mm -hmm. and more simple to assess. So mm -hmm. that's what's exciting, I would say, right now. So that's interesting. I, I mean, we've talked about this before. Um, we did that Rooted in Health event last year that was yeah. really talking about that. Um, so comparing the the driver of what we call carbon um, and and this nutrition, yeah. India nutrient density. Um, and you just said it was simpler to assess. Do you think that's the case right now? It's simpler to assess right now or we need this tool to develop to get there? Uh, we don't have nutrient density yet. We have nutrient variation. We've mm -hmm. proven concept is plausible. We're saying million bucks for beef, 750 for pork, 500 for chicken and lamb. Million bucks for oats, 750 for wheat, 500 for you know rice and, and rye. Million for soy, 750 for you do it down. Every family of plants, it's gonna cost a certain amount of dollars to actually define this. And then everybody's gonna have access to the data. And we can keep improving it. But in short order, um, I think the opportunities are very significant to drive this thing. And yeah, to that point about more significant economic impact for the grower than carbon. Yeah, and I'll just add in there, you know, as I said, we've talked about this before in the investment community as well. And I'd say carbon is definitely like the buzzword, um, as we were talking about before in my presentation. Yeah. But I think nutrient density is getting up there because people and investors are increasingly seeing that connection to human health. Um, but I, I don't know that we're absolutely there yet. I hope, I hope no, that uh, we don't even have nutrient density defined yet, but we're positioned to do that with human health trials with the USDA, the money's in the bank already. I mean, yeah. Well, and I, yeah. And what I was going to add to that was you said, uh, you know, significantly more for the grower. I think in the long term, it also, there, it's saving us a lot of money from a global scale and healthcare perspective, too. There's a lot of other connections there that will every country spending. 10, 20, 30% of their GDP on healthcare, mm -hmm. every developed country, you drop that by 10% or, or 50%. Great. I mean, locations are massive. We, we just need to make, continue to draw those connections so that- um, in space, Once we define nutrient density and have the meters in place, it's all gonna just fall into place. We're, we're, we're not very far away from having this. Yeah. Great to hear. Uh, so question, uh, 
do increased Haney tests, I'm going, I'm going to go back to some of our audience questions. Uh, I don't want to neglect yeah. them for sure. Um, do increased Haney test results, um, results correlate with increased nutrient in products? Likely. Uh, because Rick quit the USDA last year, we didn't get Haney tests integrated into our, into our process. They were supposed to be next to the Logan tests, mm. but we didn't get the free tests anymore. So I would say very likely those things correlate, but that's the whole point is we look at all these things next to each other with no dogma. We just look at them all. Yeah. Okay, so similarly, the, the question came up about plant sap tests that measure food exactly. vegetables. That's the, the whole structure is designed so we can see which assessments, which programs, which products actually result in what effects. Mm -hmm. Non-dogmatically, globally. Structuring water, prayer, you know, whatever it is. Great. Okay. Sorry, just making sure I get all the questions here. Um, the Q and A has been longer than you were anticipating. Thank you for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, can much you, more fun than presenting, I, I think. <laughs> can you? Um, I think. I guess we know we can go to your websites to get more um, data, um, reliable research on food nutrient density. Are there other uh, sources that you would recommend for our audience? On which question? Oh, on the, oh, I just scrolled away from it. Um, done on food nutrient density. Just research on that. I mean, basically there is none. We don't have, we don't have a definition for it. It's a totally open space. I mean, that's what's exciting is that it's, it seems to connect. All these pieces seem to connect around this thing, which is the quality of the food. And there's no data. Nobody's really actually looked at it. It's, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean. So, so all your no. research is well, out there. I mean, we're getting it published this year, but, but yeah. I, when I started at Acres 15 years ago with John, you know, as I said at the beginning, it was, they talked about bricks and they talked about this thing, which was food quality. And they talked about, that was the point. And we all said, yes. And we said, what is it? And they said, we don't know. It doesn't matter. We're consultants. We're salespeople. We know it gets the results. We don't care about the deeper thing. And, we, and I said, you know, I come from the nonprofit background, education, you know, what organization is talking about this? And there was no organization talking about this. So um, I, think, I think we're just trying to carry on a lineage and deepen the conversation. But it's, you know, as Acres was and has been cutting edge, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't, I don't see anybody else who's actually figured it out. So hmm. we get to a very big edge. <laughs> well, the more we talk about it, the more we'll get out there and learn more about it. So I think it's, yeah, building. Yeah, it's building very nicely. Yeah. So uh, getting back to this conversation on partners uh, and just different folks and how they're engaging in this topic, uh, we have one question uh, that says wholesalers are ready to pay premium for denser nutrient foods based on the result of your B BQI calculation. Uh, so I think the question is, are wholesalers ready to pay premium for denser nutrient food based on the results of your BQI calculation? Um, we're starting to talk to companies that you so, know have that interest. Um, we haven't really begun to put out. We, mm -hmm. we, we just started a month ago to say, this is what we found. We've been, we've been running dark for a long time because we figured better to do the work first than talk about it too much. So I expect a lot to transpire this year. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, and if people know those who might be interested, feel free to make connections. Well, good. That was one of the questions I keep thinking is, so you want this to be collaborative, open, and we know that that's a key really to moving some solutions forward. Are Who are the folks that you want to be working with? Or are there any groups in particular that would be um, help move this along faster? I've always said there's two, there's two, uh, <laughs> two things that require in a partner, honor and capacity. If you're honorable, if you mean well, and you're capable and you can do things, let's go. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, scale doesn't matter. It's, it's, you know, there's a web, it's a web of relationships and connections and 
you know, we're a nonprofit. We don't have money. We, we don't have IP. We don't have control. It's all about the the honor and the the mission. And so, I think it, it takes all kinds. So we're very, you know, we've got local chapters and we've got meter parties and we've got citizen scientists and and grower partners and, um, you know, obviously philanthropists and companies and you know universities and things like that are partners as well. But um, I don't know. I, I I I always say when people say, you know, what do you need? I say, what do you feel inspired to do? What's your passion? What's your calling? What's your true genius? Because you should do that. And that, that connects, that's wonderful. But don't, it's not, it's not serving some other thing. It's just following your own internal guidance. Great. So if there's interest um, and passion for this topic, then it's time for a conversation, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Great. Uh, so more technical question here. Does livestock, um, does livestock consume less feed when eating high nutrient level forages compared to conventional ag crop forage? And the example they gave is increased milk production for the dairy industry. Um, my understanding is that the cost of production is lower. The ecosystem function benefit is higher. When you're converting corn to, to, uh, you know, Orchard grass and things. I'm not sure how I can put that directly. Um, when we look at the value of the milk, I don't think there's any question. But it's a question of how we. What, what are the metrics? It's a technical question. Um, what does they say? The the you know in 1491 there was more beef beef being produced in Iowa than there is now. The Native Americans were managed in the landscape to produce more more pounds of beef per acre than is being produced through through corn and soy production now. So yeah, it's a question of how we define terms, but in my understanding, working with nature is much more efficient. Uh, and this audience is interested, so I'm scrolling through all these questions. So <laughs> does um, shelf life in vegetables correlate with shelf? Uh, hold on. Nutrient density. Yes. Nutrient density, I think they put shelf life, but I think nutrient density is what they're asking. Yes. Yeah. I always say if you've ever bought an orange and put on the sh on the counter or two oranges and one of them turned green and into a pile of mush and one turned into a hard brown ball, you know what desiccation and rotting are. And that directly connects to the biochemistry of the plant. So you know, plants should dry up, should not rot. When they're of higher quality, they will do that. And shelf life directly connects to nutrient density, to bricks, mm -hmm. flavor, health, et cetera. Yeah. And see, that seems like a key lever right there for that value conversation and what, say, a retailer might. <laughs> There's so many opportunities. It's an uncouple bottom line. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not like a, oh, we got a 10% variation. They're like, no, guys. <laughs> Yeah, what are the outcomes of that variation? What does that mean? And yeah, that's very interesting. Things they can make and cost reductions and everything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, we gotta get we gotta get more information out there and communicate it to the right folks. Start building the data set. Keep building the data set. In, in, involve the community. That's it. The process is to just you know be step by step. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so David has a great question. Who are the John Kemp's of human nutrition? Uh, this is a, there's more than one question here. So who are the John Kemp's of human nutrition? How do we know what nutrients foods really help us climb a people health pyramid? And uh, he says he's thinking of maybe former dairy farm boy T. Colin Campbell. But who are your heroes? Who are my heroes? Um, who are the the human nutrition John Kemp's. <laughs> uh, those are two different questions, perhaps. I would love to know who the human nutrition John Kemp's are. Um, I mean, to the point of this presentation, Bruce Tanio was, uh, you know, the one living brilliant soul in the Acres community, beyond Charles, of course. I mean, Charles was the founder and the true brilliant being, but I didn't get to meet Callahan. I didn't get to meet, you know, a number of people. 
Um, Reams, I didn't get to meet Reams, Steiner. Um, I think in what world do you travel? You know, you know, on whose shoulders do you stand? I think, uh, you know, I, I come from this, from this alternative ag community and I, I found the acres community to be most profound in my, in my sort of teacher set. Fukuoka. Yes, absolutely. Didn't meet him either. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a number of them. So it's, it's a, it's, I don't know if I have a hero. I think, I think truth is that we all have our own calling. We all have our own, our own voice. And we, and we follow that. I don't, if others can help us tune into that, great. Um, but I think the point of nutrient density versus organic, if I can, you know, bring it back around to the full circle is, do you trust the priest to tell you what God said, or do you have a direct connection with God? You know, does the organic label say what's good or bad, or are you able to test directly with your meter? 80th percentile, 60th percentile, 20th percentile. Um, I think if we can engage that level of nuance and discernment and collective engagement, the opportunities are, are massive. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, hopefully that was a reasonable answer. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I think there's a lot of folks out there, many of the guys that you mentioned uh, there, and hopefully we have a new uh, John Kemp's of Human Nutrition coming online too as we continue to expand this topic, yeah. body of research. Um, so. Yeah. Little, little shift here uh, and getting more to the economics of this and access to it. So how do we ensure farmers can thrive and minimum wage workers can buy this food once we do quantify it? So um, this person says money makes the world go around and I have already experienced investors moving towards this goal because they want to charge more. So how can we keep this affordable? I think there's a couple of things there. I think for the growers that are doing a good job already, being able to establish a market where they can receive a premium for their quality is going to be profoundly empowering to them and to inspire their their neighbors and i also think from the from the uh, community engagement perspective the usda puts a lot of money into commodities and into school lunches and if we had a definition for beef for quality Let's require that the USDA does not buy any beef from the red. There's red, yellow, and green, right? We're going to do what we'll allow yellow and green right now for school lunches and for, um, you know, homeless shelters, et cetera. But if we actually had a standard and we've got uncounted billions of dollars going to, you know, commodity payments right now, let's organize a system where that which is provided to many who need it is of a certain basic caliber. Um, I, I mean, we can look into 2x, 4x, 6x variation. We can talk about, you know, uh, you know um, snap cards or whatever they are now and say, you know, we're only going to have the snap card work for things that are certainly above a certain level. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities. I don't think it has to be just the straight business economic market, if we look at the whole ecosystem of the, of the culture and the, and the government um, and the movement, to figure out what the leverage points are. But if we don't foundationally have a definition of that variation, then we can't actually engage the movement. And so that's what we're saying right now is like, look, we've, we've, we've done proof of concept, we've shown we can do a meter, we've shown variation exists, we've shown it connects to management. Who's in on the next level of actually defining the tree density so we can bring this to bear? We've, we've proven this is a viable strategy, and now it's just time to implement it. Perfect. Well, uh, I think that is good for our questions that we have, but I want to thank you for your work um, in building that foundation and also remind everybody in our audience that uh, there is an open door to be collaborators with Dan in this effort and to yeah. please reach out to him and to the Bionutrient Food Association um, to uh see what how we can move this forward so thank you so much dan thank you sarah <laughs>